Hello, BookTube. I went to the Brattle today, the Brattle Bookshop in downtown Boston, and I got a gigantic pile of books. So let me explain. <laughs> I, I don't need a gigantic pile of books. I got a gigantic pile of books at the Brattle today for two reasons. One is that there's a chance that it's going to rain tomorrow. And I don't think that's actually going to happen. All the weather forecasters are saying it, sure, it certainly is, and that it's a high percentage, which leads me to think it won't happen at all, that not a single drop of rain will fall. But that's always a spur to me. It always has been that if some big change in the weather is coming, I feel like going to the Brattle and stocking up on books. But there's another reason that is far more important, which is that this is my last trip to the Brattle for quite some time. <laughs> Believe it or not, it is. I have a suspicion that in March, I'm going to do a concentrated amount of book hunting, the like of which modern day physics says is impossible. <laughs> a gigantic amount of book hunting in March. In the run up to that, the immediate run up to that, which we are now in, <laughs> technically we are now in that two week run up, it would be unthinkable to buy any more used books than I did today. and. In the aftermath of that orgy, that bacchanal of book buying, uh, I'll probably lay off as well. I wouldn't be surprised if I don't shop at the Brattle again until April. I, I would also be surprised if uh, I waited that long. <laughs> but you never know. Right now, that's my resolution. I got a pile of books to show you here that I view, it's not like I, I got this huge pile of books, but I'll be back at the Brattle next week. It's not like that's going to happen. Uh, except for special occasions, you know, maybe here or there. But uh, I, I want to go through these with you. Uh, it was a huge amount of fun. It was a beautiful spring day. So it was a huge amount of fun to, to be there and to, you know, poke all around and everywhere. Uh, and I made some finds. Some, some genuine finds, things that I haven't ever seen in a used bookstore or I almost never see, things that I genuinely want. So let's let's go through those. And we'll start with, uh, I got basically two stacks of books. I got a stack of mass market paperbacks and a stack of trade paperbacks and hardcovers. The mass market paperbacks are the smaller paperbacks that used to be ubiquitous. They are not ubiquitous anymore. They used to be small and everywhere and cheap. They're now a lot bigger just taller size, they're not everywhere anymore, and they're not cheap anymore. It used to be that with a, with a small amount of pocket change, you could go into your local store and get three or four of them. That was the whole point, was that you could do that. Uh, and as a result, almost everything came out in mass market. They aren't really made anymore. Romances still come out in mass market paperbacks, but almost nothing else does. So, all the mass market paperbacks that you see out in the wild in the used book ecosystem are numbered. They, they are numbered. They are, they are no longer being made. So, I found a bunch of mass market paperbacks, including a few that I've never seen before. Uh, so, let's see. What do we have here? Okay, well, this first one is science fiction. Uh, this is the early Del Rey. Early short stories by Lester Del Rey. And uh, there is an evil clown on the cover. But most people who are looking at this, uh, most people who are born in the 21st century who are looking at this cover are not going to be arrested by the evil clown. They're going to be arrested by this weird steampunk machine. <laughs> and I, I, want to stress to you, I want to stress to you that this is not a science fiction machine. That is a manual typewriter. <laughs> Once upon a time, we all lived and died by those things. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't think I've ever seen this volume. I'll reinforce it just a little uh, it it's, will probably be really enjoyable to me. I think that Lester Del Rey's fiction, I know that this is sacrilege, but I think his fiction got worse the more important he became in the industry. The, the closer he came to becoming what we would now call an influencer, I think the more, I don't want to say bloated and unsatisfying, because he was never that, but the more um, conservative his science fiction becomes, There's, the fire goes out of him. And I, I, this will probably have, probably be pure fire. Um, what else do we have here? Let's see. Oh, okay. I found two of these, uh, by an author we've already seen this, this author did the Haven trilogy and I found his, uh, two of his books of high fantasy, Samarkand and Samarkand Dawn. 
<laughs> Graham Diamond is his name. Uh, Samarkand is at the crossroads of the world where east meets west stands the fabled city of Samarkand. But the city is under siege by a million Mongol barbarians led by the crazed Khan, Kabul. When Samarkand finally falls in flames and blood, only a handful of survivors, including Princess Sharon, escape to the hills where Khazir tri tribesmen wait. Instead of helping the princess regain her throne, the Khazirs have other plans. Once the rulers of Samarkand centuries ago, they, their seers have prophesied the Khazirs will rule again with the chieftain Tariq as king. So I'm assuming the shirtless barbarian there is Tariq. This will be fantasy uh, with a decidedly eastern flavor to it, which is, which is terrific. Uh, should we just stick with the with the science fiction? I got a lot of science fiction. I got a lot of everything. I'll, uh, I'll like, for instance, this. I haven't had this uh, this paperback. What did this cost when it came out? Two dollars and ninety five cents. I haven't had this paperback since then. When was that? Nineties, seventies, eighties. Nineteen eighty seven was the uh, was the Berkeley paperback edition of Callahan's Cross Time Saloon by Spider Robinson. Now I'm assuming. Uh, Graham Diamond, Lester Del Rey, Spider Robinson. I am assuming that all of the authors I'm going to show you today are good and truly dead. <laughs> In a couple of cases, because I killed them myself. <laughs> uh, Spider Robinson has a very... Uh, it's a sharp, but it's a very friendly, uh, almost, uh, he would hate the word, but cuddly, fun science fiction. Very much in the, the uh, Douglas Adams, Piers Anthony type vein. Uh, if you're in the mood for it, it's exactly what you'll what you'll want. Um, should we stick with science fiction? Here's a uh, Massachusetts boy. This is with a single spell by Lawrence Watt Evans, the uh, uh, a fantasy story. If I remember correctly, I haven't read this since it first came out in 1987. Uh, and then you've got uh, Frank Frazetta cover there. Uh, if I remember this correctly, it's about uh, a hapless you know boy who apprentices with a, with a wizard that only get, gets time to teach him one spell before the wizard dies. He just knows how to make fire. Uh, and it, the, the, a novel expands out from there. This author is terrific. I'm very happy with giving him a slow and steady reread. Uh, oh, goodness gracious. All right, well, what about this? What on earth is this? I just grabbed it. I just, it still has the sticker on it. I just I just grabbed it. Uh, I think that this will probably be fodder for Garb August, mainly because we don't yet have uh, the kind of big, all-encompassing fantasy event on BookTube that I would like. Uh, this is by Asa Drake, and it is Were Beasts of Hell. <laughs> uh, that is quite the cover there. <laughs> what have we got here? Uh, he is Lokith, Antichrist of Helheim and son of the warrior woman Bloodsong. Once destroyed by his mother, now allied with the death goddess Hell, he is back with a vast army of death riders from the blackest depths of the netherworld to claim evil dominion over all. Her army now, Lokith's skull slaves, her companions few, Bloodsong must face her son's vengeful fury and battle soul foul hell forces across the frozen wilds of the north. Okay, <laughs> it's high fantasy, but I'm thinking it belongs in Carb August. Uh, let me have, I haven't seen this book. I read a paperback copy of this. 1980s, it's got to be the 90s. Oh, no, 1978. I read a copy of this back then. I've never seen it since. I've never even thought about this author since, so I will give this another try, even though it has another Boris Vallejo cover and perhaps the most frightening cover of any science fiction or fantasy novel. Uh, this is God's Fire, which I believe is Cynthia Felice's debut novel. Uh, I oh my God, I don't know. I wonder how long I'll reading into this book I'll get before I start to remember it. I wonder if that'll be if that'll be true. This is about a race of a feline race of, of aliens. Look at that; that is just horrifying. <laughs> oh my God! Uh, all right, well let's continue with the science fiction until we're done then, because we it's not all science fiction. I got uh, a Lynn Carter. Lynn Carter will certainly do for Garb August. I, I couldn't do without it. I couldn't pass it up when these are all a dollar. I couldn't do without it. So I found one called Down to a Sunless Sea, which I've read before, but I don't think it had this cover. Uh, this is the cover of the edition that I found today. Uh, and you can see a novel of heroic, of legendary Mars, because this author, like so many of us, uh, never wanted to leave Barsoom. 
Never wanted to leave Edgar Rice Burroughs Bar Soon. Uh, what have we got here? Brant's life had ha had been hard after the courts had sent him to the penal colony of Trivium Charontis on Mars. Since working his way to freedom, he had run guns to the high clan princes, sold them liquor and forbidden tobacco, and peddled narcotics to the soft, timid earthsider clerks. He had stolen, he had cheated at cards, he had killed a man more than once. Now fleeing from justice across an ancient dust oceans of Mars, he had no way of knowing that he was running toward the most fantastic adventure any man had ever lived. I think I've read this. I'll have to look online and see if any other cover jogs my memory, because this one doesn't. Put these over here so you can see the bean. Uh, but it'll take an hour, and Lynn Carter's always good for an hour. Uh, okay, an other, another science fiction. This I, I absolutely love. It actually, years and years ago, made it onto a list of mine of great science fiction novels. This is from the 90s? Yes, 1993. This is Alfred Koppel's Glory. Look at that cover. You can't tell, but the cover is embossed six ways from Sunday. Um, and it's it's the beginning of, of a series of books about um, an interstellar ship with solar sails and uh, a very, very politically charged crew. I don't think I ever read any of the others. I, I read this during one endlessly long, hot summer and loved it. Uh, and I've never seen it since. So here it is. I'm just, I just, I grabbed all this stuff. A lot of it I'd never seen before. Like, for instance, this next one. This is a last science fiction. Yeah, this is a last science fiction. Uh, and I, this is a Timescape book. I've mentioned before in Brattle Sale Halls, the, or Mail Halls, or Book Halls, that once upon a time, uh, who was it? Pocket Books did a, a Timescape imprint, and that would be printed on the top of the cover. And it could be, it usually was for me, that if a book had a Timescape imprint, I would get it because there were there was a, a critical presence behind that label. The, there were people doing good picking, and I got this thing uh, from Timescape, and this was 1982. I got this thing from Timescape and read it, uh, but I had I have since had a very charged reaction with this book. This is science fiction. But the author of this book is known for another book, a book that isn't science fiction. This is Soldier Boy by Michael Shar, the author of The Killer Angels. And I, see, you've got the timescape livery here, the lines all array around the cover like that, another Boris Vallejo cover. I, I, will, uh, I, have, I read this, and this, as I remember correctly, it's a collection of short stories. Uh, let's see. Uh, this highly acclaimed short story by the brilliant Michael Shire is presented here in book form for the first time. Oh, okay. So, um, no, okay, no, it's not. <laughs> you, you, you contradict yourself. Along with 15 more of his finest short stories, including Dark Angel and Starface, two brand new works. Okay, so it isn't, the story is not presented in book form. It's presented in a book. It's not, he didn't lengthen it to a book. So this is a collection of short stories. Okay, that's what I remembered. I'd have been really amazed if that weren't true. I have not read this in forever. And in the meantime, I have read The Killer Angels more times than I can count. So <clears throat> I couldn't pass it up. For a dollar, I couldn't pass it up. Uh, then we have, let's see here, uh, Book 2, Book 2 Event. I mentioned Garb August, but another Book 2 Event is uh, June on the Range, where we all read Westerns. And so whenever I find a Western at the Brattle for a dollar, I grab it, and uh, unlike a lot of these other books, uh, when I go to the Brattle and lug these things back here and glom all over them and inventory them and look through them and all, invariably one or two are going to make it onto the reading pile for that night. I'm not just chucking these on the shelf and forgetting about them. Uh, but the Westerns, or for instance, if I know, for instance, where Beasts of Hell I will probably leave for Garb August, if I know for sure that, it's, that I'm going to read it in some other event, then I, uh, I will just chuck it aside without any hesitation. I'm going to read Westerns during June. Uh, but I found a couple of Westerns. I found one by Lee Morgan called, it's a, a McMaster's book, fifth in a sizzling Western series. Uh, this is, I doubt that Lee Morgan is the author's name. This is McMaster's Mexican Standoff. Not a whole lot of uh, gun leather going on there, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I couldn't pass it up. It looks just cheesy enough. Of course, the quintessence of fun in the summer, as ter in terms of booktube events, the quintessence of fun is when you get uh, a Western that is so bad it counts as garbage, because <laughs> then you're having the best of both worlds. I found one other Western, uh, this thing. 
by Al Cody. I looked at this and racked my brains to think if I had read this, and I don't think I have. This is Marshall of Deer Creek. And it's one of these older paperbacks that has the, uh, the coating, the laminated coating is just coming off it in, in very, very adhesive strips. I'll just take those off rather than have them clip on anything. But uh, he seems to be in trouble. <laughs> He's hanging from a stagecoach. Uh, so I will, uh, I will just chuck this on the pile. It and McMaster's. I'll chuck them both on the pile for June on the Range. Uh, then, historical fiction. There is no huge event, as far as I know, no huge book two event for historical fiction. There should be. Uh, but I found, the other day when I was at the Brattle, I found an Edison Marshall historical novel. Uh, I forget even which one it was. I, uh, but I, when, I, when I was talking to you about him, I, I knew just off the top of my head what readers of a previous generation knew about him, which is that he wrote a book called Yankee Pacha. That was his most famous book. That was his most successful book. Uh, and I saw a bunch of copies of Yankee Pasha at the Brattle today with a bunch of different covers, which really shows you how popular it was. It was reprinted a lot of times. So I got one of them. So, and so that I, I'll have Yankee Pasha and I can reread it. I haven't. I read it once upon a time, but haven't read it in forever. Uh, then a uh, Viking Portable Library Edition that I have never seen. I didn't even know it existed which is kind of amazing. I'm a big champion of the old Viking portable libraries, and I thought I'd had them all. Whether I kept them or not, I thought I'd had them all. But I found one today uh, that I've never seen. This is Hacklet's Voyages. The portable Hacklet's Voyages. Uh, which is, uh, <laughs> so what are you gonna, what are you gonna do? With, I couldn't leave it behind for a dollar. This is, Hacklet was a uh, prolific writer, an explorer, a uh, churchman in the Elizabethan Jacobean era and wrote a famous book called Hacklet's Voyages, which is not all that long, I guess. So I guess that's why I kind of did a double take when I saw this out in the sale lot, because for not many more pages, you could just have his book. You could just print his book. Unless, unless the actual original version of his book is much longer than I thought. This is about the length of the Penguin Classic of Hacklet's Voyages, so, or any other edition that I've seen. So I could be wrong about that, but I love his, just that, that effortless prose style of the period. I love it, and I've never seen it before. And then a mass market paper bag. This thing is not going to live well. I don't think it's going to survive a reread, but I really, really want to reread it because it is so good. The, the author is Nicholas Montserrat, who I've praised many times on this channel for his book, The Cruel Sea. If there were a historical fiction booktube event, The Cruel Sea would be right up there on any kind of TBR of mine. He wrote all kinds of books, and he, he had a sweet tooth for writing nautical fiction. The Cruel Sea is mostly nautical fiction, including some of its... It has five or six just unbelievably memorable scenes. Uh, but every once in a while, he would get a, a yen just to write a shorter work. And one of his... He did two shorter nautical works that are sheer brilliant. And not, not a single word out of place. He wrote a lot that wasn't like that, because he was... He was a hack, but uh, when he was on his game, he he knew it and would not make a book longer than it had to be. He wrote two nautical fiction shorter works that are terrific. One is The Ship That Died of Shame, and I found a mass market paperback of the other one, HMS Marlboro Will Enter Harbor, uh, which is, it's a very short thing. It's even shorter than this because the, the typeface here is really big. Uh, it's basically a novella, uh, taking no time at all to read. And it's about a ship that's out out on patrol, out doing its duty, when it is gored by a torpedo. It isn't sunk, but it's falling apart. And it suddenly, it, it, the story becomes a battle of pride for the men to get HMS Marlboro safely to harbor rather than give up. I, I, I'm not doing a good job of describing it, but it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I don't have a lot of Nicholas Montserrat. He seems to, unfortunately, he seems to have been forgotten, including The Cruel Sea, uh, which you'd think would be anyone's ticket to immortality. But no. So uh, so it and the Hacculate were the, were the nautical-themed things. Uh, okay, let's, let's put the mass market paperbacks. Oh, there's the where. Oh, no. Oh, no. Where Beasts of Hell. I'm looking at this on the cover, and it, 
Asa Drake is listed as the author of Warrior Witch of Hell and Death Riders of Hell. So I think Where Beasts of Hell is probably the third book in a series. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Let's pile all these over here. Get them out of the way. The Feng Shui is always difficult when you're dealing with quite this many books, but we're only halfway through. So we're gonna, now we'll move on to the bigger stuff, the trade paperbacks and the hardcovers. Uh, and you'll have to pardon some hypersonic squealing because I had some fines. Some of these mass markets are fines I haven't seen Soldier Boy in the old Timescape paperback in forever. Just in forever, in decades. Uh, this first one is uh, Walt Kelly. This is Pogo, his great cartoon character Pogo, a mild-mannered possum in the Okefenokee Swamp. Uh, he, Walt Kelly used Pogo to... It's difficult to describe. Pogo was part of an era of great newspaper cartoon strips, and that era is largely over. It largely ended a long time ago, where where the newspaper a newspaper comic strip brought you into a world, it created a world, it expected you to be a repeat reader. It wasn't built around one-liners, it wasn't built around jokes. And it could be serious. It could move you in addition to making you laugh. Uh, I'm a big fan of that phenomenon, and some of my favorite things in American literature belong to that phenomenon. <laughs> I saw a volume today at the Brattle of Bernie Hogarth's Tarzan. Uh, but most famously for me would probably be uh, the big three, which is Prince Valiant, Lil Abner, and Pogo by Walt Kelly. I found uh, we have met the enemy, and he is us. <laughs> those of you who know your history will recognize those animals. <laughs> Not Pogo, but these three have very recognizable faces. <laughs> they, they might be animals, but they have very recognizable faces. <laughs> and that's what Walt Kelly did. All very gentle. All very loving and very, very good. Uh, the artwork here is just so good. Just you can see uh, the the influence on later on later artists like Jeff Smith. His Bone books owe a lot to Pogo, uh, and the tradition continued. That tradition continued. I mean, you know this. Uh, what I consider these second-rate ones, like Tumbleweeds or BC or Al Cap, but it or Blondie, but it continued. The, the, the bigger, more operatic, more amazing things, that's, that tradition went on for a while, forever and ever there was Doonesbury. A lot of you will be familiar with Calvin and Hobbes. As far as I know, it's all but dead. There was in the, the I think the, I think it sputtered out in the early 2000s, there was a, a newspaper comic strip called Zitz, that had something of that spirit, but I don't. I think it was alone by that point. Calvin and Hobbes ended. I think Doonesbury is over, and there's nothing else to replace it because the newspaper ended, and that's where these things showed up. I guess the the successor would be web comics of one kind or another, but I haven't really studied them. But Pogo, I love, absolutely love, and this is a, this title is really famous. Of all, there were a million Pogo volumes, and there were also a million Pogo volumes at the shop uh, this morning. A lot of them were in poor condition because these things were loved by kids. They were pawed over by the whole family. They, before they got they got put in a box up in the attic, they were in rough shape. I got mainly, I centered on this one because it's still in excellent shape. Um, okay, then this next one definitely counts as a find. Uh, I, I looked at this. It's just a pamphlet. Every, you get everything at the Brattle. Out in the sale lot, you get everything. There were boxes and boxes of magazines out there, for instance. Uh, heavy metal magazine. A hundred back issues of Heavy Metal magazine. You find everything out there, not just books. I saw a pamphlet, and I glanced at it, and I thought, I, you know, don't want a pamphlet, for God's sake. I'm accumulating enough books as it is. I, so I, I glanced at it and just went right by it, and then I thought, wait a minute. I recognize that building. Why do I recognize that building? And there's a good reason why I do. This is a pamphlet. It was never meant for sale. It is celebrating 100 years of the Norman Williams Public Library in Woodstock, Vermont, with the, the classic three-arch front there. I have been to this library many, many times. Right inside the front door of the building, right now in Woodstock, they have an ongoing library book sale. Every time Mark Richardson and I drove, drove by this place, we would go in. <laughs> We've done book hauls that we got of books from this place, this very library. Well, this is going to tell me everything that I wanted to know about Woodstock Public Library. Uh, where it comes from, who 
originally founded it. All that sort of stuff is going to be in there. It was so wild to see this. Frida has been in this building. <laughs> she she I, she has gone into this building. There's a little foyer before the main doors to the, the main library. In that foyer, there are shelves, and they are full of books. It's an ongoing library book sale. If you go to the Woodstock Public Library, or I guess it's not. I guess it's the Norman Williams Public Library. If you go there today, those books will be there. And then you can open the glass doors and go into the library itself, uh, where I think a few more books are on sale, and that's where the librarians are. Every time that we went, we would shop for books out in that foyer, and then you have to pay for them inside. I, I would open the, the glass doors, and Frida would charge in, stand at the end of her leash, throw back her head, and scream. <laughs> it would echo along these old wooden rafters for people to come and pet her. <laughs> It's amazing. This definitely needs to make its way up to Vermont. What are the chances that even Mark will see this? And he might want it. <laughs> he might want it more than I do. Uh, then uh, uh, trade paperback. This is in rough shape. Someone uh, uh, reinforced this thing. Uh, it's a science fiction... I would say a science fiction classic. I don't know if science fiction does classics anymore that aren't written by N.K. Jemison. It would it'd be nice if someone would reprint this. This is Poole Anderson, and this is uh, The Boat of a Million Years. See, somebody, somebody, it wasn't me. Somebody taped the cover of this thing in order to in order to reinforce it. I've seen this in hardcover. I, I think I saw it at the Brattle years ago in a mass market paperback. I don't have it, though. and It's, it's a terrific story. Is this a... Uh, is that a Vincent DeFante cover? I, I always say that. I, I don't know if it will even be attributed. No. The cover art is not attributed at all. Okay, well, but anyway, this is a, a weird science fiction novel. This is... It's the story of a group of immortals. And it, we follow them through their lives, their various lives. So the point of it really isn't techno-futuristic science fiction. The... the the, the I mean, you get that. You get lots of it towards the end of the book, but the heart and soul of the science fiction in here is just the immortals themselves. And I love it. It's I, it, Aside from Flandry, aside from the Ensign Flandry novels, this is my favorite uh, by Anderson. Uh, so I was glad to have it, even though it's in a little bit parlous shape. Then a big, opulent ma a trade paperback of something that I once read as a mass market paperback. I bet a lot of you read it as a mass market paperback. This author seems to be gone. Again, I am saying all of these authors are well and truly dead. <laughs> uh, this author's work seems to be gone. I don't know that anybody reads her anymore. Once upon a time, she had a heyday. The author is Marge Piercy. I wonder how many of you are fans of Marge Piercy. I w read a bunch of her novels when they were coming out in mass market paperbacks with those photos on the cover. I didn't like any of them. <laughs> but I found uh, her biggest, most ambitious novel today for a dollar, so I grabbed it. This is Gone to Soldiers in a big trade paperback. Look like that. I've never seen this trade paperback before. It's her World War II novel. Uh, I remember reading this. I remember thinking, you know, this, there's nothing bad about this. It's just that I don't like it. Well, that's exactly the kind of estimation of a book that is most prone to change. If, if I had said, when did this come out? The 1990s? 1987. If I had said in 1987, all right, I sat down with this, I, I sat myself back, I let beagles settle in all around me, and then I read this thing carefully. I read it critically, I read it pencil in hand. Well, if I had done that in 1987 and I had finished saying, that was not good. There, here are, I wasn't reviewing books in 1987, but if, if I had said in 1987, well, actually I was, a little bit. I'd never reviewed this, though. Uh, if, but if I had sat back from that read-through and thought, I didn't like that. It wasn't good, and here are my ten reasons why. Then now, thirty years later, it'd be unlikely. I know it's how this sounds horrible, but it'd be unlikely that that would be wholesale different. I pay really close attention, and I'm pretty good at paying attention to books. So, if in 1987 or 1977 or 1967 I say, "Okay, this has self-evident flaws. They are they are serious. They prevent me from really loving it," then that's probably not going to be all that different. Now, but with, but with many books at the time, in 1977, 1967, 1987, 1997, with plenty of books, my reaction was the same as it was to this. There's nothing wrong with this. I just didn't like it. That is prime fodder for reconsideration. So I'll give this a try. I'm always up for a big fat book. Uh, then a rebuy. Uh, I found a rebuy in perfect condition, but that's good because the copy that I, that I showed you 
on a library tour years ago, one of you snapped up. <laughs> it's the same old, same old, the same old song and dance that you give me, and I fall for it, sap that I am. You say, oh, I don't trust anybody online. And are there no books anywhere around me? The nearest grocery store is 300 miles away, and uh, I have to bike on my, I have to pedal on my bike that whole distance. There are no books anywhere around. Oh, <laughs> but I sure would love that book. <laughs> That works. So I sent that. I sent a copy of this book, and I found it. The, the one that I have here, I would have grabbed it anyway. It's in perfect condition. This is uh, My Wilderness, East to Katahdin, by Justice William O. Douglas, uh, with uh, illustrations all throughout here by Francis Lee Jacks. So you've got spot illustrations, and uh, and also, I think, bigger page illustrations no did you not do that more spot illustrations yeah uh but this is there's, there's justice douglas right there wild bill du du douglas uh he served on the supreme court william douglas did a really interesting figure difficult to know definitely not a time server in life definitely someone who wanted to live his own way regardless of whether or not you always agree with him or ever did very very much an individual character he served on the Supreme Court for a long, a long time. I think the longest serving justice. Still, I think he still has the record for the person who was on the court the longest. He was appointed on the court as a very young man, like in his 40s, and just stayed there forever. And in addition to a huge amount of work that he did on the court, he also wrote a huge number of books, including nature books. He wrote, My Wilderness had two parts to it. One was on the West Coast, and he was really familiar with the West Coast, and one was... Uh, this east to to Katahdin, and that would be New England. Uh, he was he was really familiar with the West Coast, and it was through the West Coast that he that he came to know his second Harry Truman. <laughs> he was, he knew one Harry Truman, and they uh, Bill Douglas had extensive political ambitions that never really happened. He was on the, the court instead, uh, but he knew. Harry Truman, the, the Harry Truman that you know <laughs> from uh, from those political dealings. But later, because he was such an avid outdoorsman, he was such an avid hiker, uh, he also came to know another Harry Truman. There was a, a guy named Harry Truman that lived uh, in a lodge, a nice, comfortable lodge, uh, right near Mount St. Helens. And Bill Douglas, believe it or not, got to know this old salt, this old crazy codger. He got to know him and swap all sorts of nature stories together. And that Harry Truman later became famous because of Mount St. Helens. He, he, when the, the volcano was rumbling and there were earthquakes, dozens of them every afternoon, when experts, when government scientists were, were, were telling people, evacuate your homes, it might be just temporary, but you have to go, he refused. The other Harry Truman refused. He said, I, I know this mountain. This mountain would never hurt me. I'm not going anywhere. And what was it, two weeks later? Less than that. Mount St. Helens erupted, and he was killed. Uh, he, he, he was one of the people who was killed. So, uh, But anyway, I doubt that he's a figure in here. In fact, I doubt this even has an index. No, no index. The, Douglas is, regardless of what you think of him on the court, no no one figure on the court can ever be on the right side of every issue. That's just the way it is. Uh, Bill Douglas is the same way. He was he was on the right side. <laughs> hey, baby, you want to get down here? Oh, these books are in your way. Oh, goodness. Do you want to get down here? Show them some Frida yoga. Frida, there you go. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh. <laughs> Uh, uh, no matter, I don't know, you probably, you, you, most of you probably don't know anything. I, I have a sweet tooth for the U.S. Supreme Court. Just had a guest here just yesterday who also has a sweet tooth for the U.S. Supreme Court. And I, as a result, have read a mountain of books by and about Supreme Court justices. And you're never going to agree with any of them 100%. And Douglas could also be theatrical in his maverick attitude towards things. And that also leads to uh, negative historical assessments. But his writing, just his prose style, is wonderful. All of his travel books, all of them are wonderful. So, And this is my favorite one. I found it today as a perfect replacement copy for the one that I sent away. 
Uh, all right, then these next two are uh, woolly bag of tales. <laughs> these next two are books that don't exactly have the laser light focus that I tend to appreciate. One of them I really liked. One of them I read the whole of its 900 pages and when it came out and thought, what the hell was that about? <laughs> I'm going to give both of them another try. For a dollar, I'm going to give both of them another try. The first one is by Deborah Kramer and it's called Great Waters. And it's just a huge, sprawling book about the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, what will it say here? Not since Rachel Carson's brilliant classic, The Sea Around Us, 50 years ago, has a writer been able to give voice to so compellingly to the ocean, its mythic history, and its precarious future. In the course of an ocean voyage, the author weaves the details of the history and science of the Atlantic into brilliant tapestry that documents our many-faceted reliance on the sea, our betrayal of that bond, and the changing landscape of the ocean floor and the threatened life of its inhabitants. I, when this first came out in, the, I want to say the early 2000s, 2001, uh, I found it severely unfocused. L lovely passages, but severely unfocused. That is not a criticism. That is not a damnation. So we, again, we will see. This could improve in my memory. Unlike this next one, uh, which I found just badly meandering. That was a critical judgment. And so this is going to have a harder row to hoe, but it was a dollar in a hardcover with a plastic da jacket on it. So um, I'll definitely give it another try. The last, the last time I read this, it, it, it was originally brought out in hardcover and I missed it completely. And then it came out, it, it was brought out in a really heavy duty trade paperback. That was the form that I read. Uh, but I'm going to read it again. This is Michael Kamen. And this is Mystic Chords of Memory. Uh, and I, it's... It's gigantic. This was this is an ex library copy. I will I will go in there and get that off there. Uh, but what what does this actually say? In this major work of historical and cultural analysis, the author examines the roles of tradition, collective memory, and patriotism in American society, and the transformations they have undergone, especially in the generations since 1870. He explores the ways in which American people acquired the sense of the past, how we ascribed symbolic meaning to it and developed regional and often rival variations, and how over the years we changed our perception of our use and our uses of the past. See, that's a little bit baggy, uh, but I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to give it another try. I haven't given it a try in a long time. Uh, all right, we're, we're, getting, we're getting into squeal territory here. The, these next two were definitely squealing. I, I, it's only because of the Brattle Bookshop that I would see these repeatedly. That is the only way. The only way. The Brattles are the only shops I know of where you will find something you've never seen before, and two years later you'll see it again. You'll see another copy of it. There was an author. Uh, he lived in the, the late 19th century. lived until the 1940s, I believe. Guglielmo Ferrero was his name, an Italian historian, uh, who brought out a multi-volume work is really, it is really one work. It, is, it ought to be as famous as The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He, he brought out a work in an English language translation, a multi volume English language translation of The Greatness and Decline of Rome. Uh, and it was a hit. Here in the United States, 100 years ago or more, it was a hit. Everybody loved it. It is so well done. It is so well done. Uh, and I don't particularly want every volume in that series. There's five volumes, and there's one volume that is basically Antony and Cleopatra. The volume is called Rome and Egypt, but it, I don't particularly want that volume. But th all the other volumes that I want, one whole volume is on Julius Caesar, and it is still, to my mind, the best Julius Caesar biography. Even though Guglielmo, uh, Ferrero didn't mean it to be one. I still think it is. For, for the sharpness of the read of the sources, for the amazing skill of bringing it all together, just incredible. He did a book, we've seen all of these on this channel, he did a book called The Fall of the Aristocracy, about the end of the Roman Republic, and I found the two other volumes today of his that I really want. Uh, the Empire Builders, which takes you from early Republican eras all the way up to the death of Julius Caesar, and you've got uh, footnotes at the bottom of every page, you've got summaries on the, on the margins there to let you know where you are in case you need to quickly look for something. It didn't surprise me at all that these volumes had cut pages all throughout because that's how good they are. You you give this to somebody, they're back then, they're going to read it. Uh, when when did this come out, actually? Uh, when was this? Oh, God. <laughs> A very delicate onion skin to protect the illustrations. Uh, 
Okay, it's not telling me, but but it came out in the first decade of the 20th century because Theodore Roosevelt was a huge fan of these books, a huge fan. He invited the author to the White House. I found uh, The Empire Builders, and I also found uh, The Republic of Augustus, which is terrific, absolutely terrific, because I have the big Cambridge Ancient History volume of Ancient Rome in multiple volumes, and they devote a whole volume, one gigantic volume. It's three times this size to the Empire of Augustus, which makes sense. Not only was it pivotal for Rome's transfer from a representative republic to an autocracy, but also it's unbelievably well documented. So there have been equally equally pivotal periods in Roman history for which we have very little in the way of reliable documentation. But the Augustan era, lots and lots of it. This is wonderful. To get these together is just wonderful. I now have, there are five volumes, I now have the four that I want. I know that's going to drive some of you crazy <laughs> that I don't, that I'm leaving one volume out in the wild. And maybe, I think maybe Roman Egypt might have been at the shop today if it was, and I ever go back, maybe I'll grab it. But I, I'm not missing it. It's covered in these volumes, and I'm, I'm not missing it. Uh, then this next thing, uh, we're getting to the end here, don't you worry. This next thing, echoes uh, a little bit that we did here, a brattle hall that we did earlier, where I found a volume by Irving Stone and an Italian translator called I, Michelangelo Sculpture, Sculptor, that is a volume of annotated letters of Michelangelo that Stone asked this translator to do new translations of. He appended an introduction and whatnot. And the reason that volume was so popular is because Irving Stone had written the book, the novel, The Agony and the Ecstasy, a gigantic historical novel about Michelangelo. In all the different periods of his life, Michelangelo lived for a long, long time, although like every other author here, I'm assuming he's dead. <laughs> I'm assuming that Michelangelo is dead. Uh, Stone wrote that book, The Agony and the Ecstasy. It was a massive, massive bestseller. And then there was a movie uh, with Charlton Heston as, as Michelangelo, and Rex Harrison as Pope Julius II. Uh, and <laughs> it was incredible. The Agony and the Ecstasy of the movie is incredible. It holds up completely. It is every bit as good now as it was. The whole story was told again, decades later, in a miniseries that some of you, if you, if you watch too much of my channel, will know that I'm very fond of. There was a miniseries called The Season of Giants. Ooh, I don't even know. Early 90s, something like that. Uh, where I'm not going to remember his name, a young actor who did not, he, he, he died in a, a racing accident, so he's not alive now as a gray-haired old man, old fixture on TV. Max something or other? Anyway, he played a very young Michelangelo, and uh, we get lots, it's an all-star cast, we get John Glover as Leonardo da Vinci, uh, but when we get to the same events from The Agony and the Ecstasy, which is Michelangelo arguing with Pope, Julius II, about artwork and the, the Sistine Chapel and whatnot. Uh, Pope Julius II is played by F. Murray Abraham, and he does a wonderful job. There are, that, that miniseries is full of great actors doing terrible work, but F. Murray Abraham does a terrific job in that, but not as good as Rex Harrison. <laughs> let's, let's be honest here. There is no relativity here or in anything else. Rex Harrison is just a better actor. No harm, no foul. I don't think that F. Murray Abraham would argue with that. Uh, a very different kind of actor. F. Murray Abraham could do Salieri in, in uh, Amadeus, whereas Rex Harrison certainly could not have. Uh, but when I showed you that book, I, Michelangelo Sculptor, I offhandedly mentioned that unbelievably, considering how popular it was and how many times I've read it, I didn't have a copy of The Agony and the Ecstasy. So I was just assuming that sooner or later I'd come across, like, you know, a crappy mass market paperback. A lot of you will remember the old orange mass market paperback. And I found a copy of the Agony of the XTC of the day, but it's not that. It's beautiful. And it's strong enough so that I think it will take a read. It's an amazing... I've never seen this before. It's uh, a big illustrated edition in a box set. And somebody even put a plastic covering over the whole thing. Just incredible. And this is this is the whole novel. It's sewn binding, though. And in addition to the whole novel, you get the artwork that is being referenced. Every, every, every section of this book, Michelangelo is working on a different piece of artwork. And you get them all in this thing. In a sturdy box with a plastic covering. That is... Uh, 
that is amazing. If I'm going to have a copy of this thing, this is probably the one that I want. It will certainly hold up better than a mass market paperback. And then to finish up, uh, the finds of the day. I know that a lot of these things count as finds, but these next two things are finds of the day because not only have I wanted them for a long time and kicked myself that I got rid of them, I, I bought them new. Not only that, but I have all I have been taunted by their prices online. Their secondhand prices online are sometimes extortionate. So I wasn't going to do that, especially since online dealers lie about the, the condition of their objects. So instead, I just faintly said the Brattle will provide. I usually say that when I'm looking for something. I think the Brattle will provide. But if I've never seen something in the wild, it's pretty faint. If I've never seen it in the wild, then I think, well... The Brattle will provide, maybe, maybe after I'm dead, <laughs> but no, no, the Brattle provided today. I still can't believe this. I'm going to lovingly clean these things up. I found The Origin of Marvel Comics and Son of Origins by Stan Lee. <laughs> oh my, this thing, look at that John Romita Sr. cover. Isn't that amazing? Uh, isn't that just amazing? I... I, with with again we we'll start we're ending as we started with a manual typewriter. This is just an anthology volume. It's just a a reprint of the origin stories of uh, classic Marvel characters, uh, with Stan Lee doing the writing, the writing job in between, uh, and that's it. <laughs> that's all it is. That's uh, it. I'm not I, I'm not saying that's all it is in an insulting way. I just. <sighs> I got this thing and loved it. I have no idea why I got rid of it. None. But here it is. I finally found the origins of Marvel Comics with John Romita Sr. doing these signature characters. Of course, he's most famous for giving us the design of Spider-Man. Uh, but you've, you've also got the, the classic sign that you're looking at John Romita Sr. Uh, is the thumbs. His thumbs always do the same things. They stick, they jut out like that. Also, John Romita Sr., he was... The art poobah behind all the artists at Marvel for a long time, uncredited, but still, he looked at every page of artwork just to make sure that it had a kind of a uniform Marvel look. And he did something, another little signature of John Romita Sr., if you, if you don't recognize him already. Uh, I don't know if there's any John Romita artwork in here. Uh, surely, surely there's a Spider-Man story in here that has Romita artwork. Yes. No. No, the Spider-Man story is Sal Buscema. Oh, no, John Buscema. There might not be any John Romita Sr. artwork in this thing. Wouldn't that be incredible? I don't think there is. Uh, but another another little quirk of his, if you're looking, I could do a whole two-hour seminar on how to identify Marvel artists from the Golden Age. But another thing that he did that he could not be talked out of, Stan Lee even talked to him about it, and he just insisted, is that his uh, Uru hammer, the hammer of Thor, you can't really make it out on this cover, is always shiny metal instead of stone. Just a tiny little thing. But that's all that this is, is uh, uh, the pros of Stan Lee introducing these wacky foundational Marvel characters. I remember when I got this at the time thinking, uh, you know, this cover is great, of course, all well and good. Uh, but remove Doctor Strange and put Captain America on here because this is Marvel Comics. So Captain America, the Submariner, and the Human Torch, this isn't that Human Torch, but not the original Human Torch, but it doesn't matter visually, should be on the cover of this thing. But <laughs> I'm so incredibly happy that I found this. And of course, it was a hit. So there were sequels. And the second book was Son of Origins, another fantastic John Romita Sr. cover. See the thumbs? <laughs> you can just, uh, by your thumbs, will you spot them? This is just amazing. You've got all these second string Marvel characters that all get their own book. The Silver Surfer, The Watcher, Nick Fury... Uh, the lame-ass character known as Daredevil, <laughs> you get them all in here with this just beautiful Romita Sr. cover. Just great. Uh, so th these, I know I know a lot of you are, don't care, but these are definitely the find of the day. Definitely. I have waited to find them. I pined for them. Now I finally have them again. Wonderful. So obviously there's no Steve Pyramid since this is 50 books. <laughs> there's a great time but it's not profligate. It's not as profligate as it looks. Because the next time I go shopping for books, the Brattle may be involved, but it's not going to be for a couple of weeks. 
and it's going to be huge. <laughs> it's going to be more book shopping than any human being has ever done in the history of humankind. <laughs> so I thought I, I, I deserved a little bit of, a, of an indulgence before I go on. Uh, not a book buying ban. It's not a book buying ban, but this will hold me over until the next time I go book hunting. So there you go. That's a brattle hall for a bright Tuesday morning. <laughs> I'll wrap this up for now. I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.